In this video lecture, we're going to concentrate on heart anatomy, in particular kind of a functional anatomy approach. So we'll look at the difference between systemic and pulmonary circulation. We'll look at the structures of the heart, although I'm not going to go into great detail about those. Um, I'm going to just expect you to learn those structures, just naming parts. And then look at the structure and function of the heart valves. And then finally end with the layers of the heart and the uh, pericardium. So let's first start with the pulmonary versus systemic circulation. I want you to think of the heart really as two pumps. When we look at this picture, first of all, keep in mind is, is as if you're looking at someone's chest. So you're looking straight on the anterior side. And so the left side of the heart is on the right side of the page. The right side of the heart is on the left side of the page. So you kind of have to think of it in those terms. But the left side of the heart then is in charge of systemic circulation. It's pumping blood out into the body, basically your head, your legs, your arms, your trunk. So the systemic circulation. And then the systemic circulation brings the blood back to the right side of the heart. And the right side of the heart is in charge of pumping blood out to the pulmonary circulation or to your lungs. So we have the systemic circulation, left side, side of the heart is responsible for that. We have the pulmonary circulation, the right side of the heart is in charge of that. Now to keep in mind too that arteries are named because of they take blood away from the heart whereas veins bring blood back to the heart. So notice that the blood coming back to the right side of the heart is in veins, it's deoxygenated blood, Arteries take blood to the um, lungs where they pick up oxygen. So these pulmonary arteries are deoxygenated blood as well. So then if the blood picks up oxygen at the lungs, it brings blood back to the heart oxygenated. So the pulmonary veins here are oxygenated and the aorta, which is the main artery, um, is also oxygenated. Now if we look at the position of the heart in the thoracic cavity, a few things to notice. One, that the heart lies in an area called the mediastinum. The mediastinum is bordered by the diaphragm on the inferior side, um, pretty much the top ribs and the clavicle on the superior side, the uh, sternum and ribs on the anterior, and the vertebral column on the posterior. So it's kind of a box in between the two lungs here, okay? That would be the mediastinum. So other structures that would be also in the mediastinum are gonna be things like the thymus, the um, esophagus, the trachea, uh, all are contained within that mediastinum. Now, and the heart of course is the biggest organ in there. Now the heart also, you can see, almost looks like it lays on its side with the apex of the heart poking more towards the left side of the body. Um, and it, so it kind of pokes in and actually makes the left lung slightly smaller because it takes up that space. Um, and then of course the major arteries are above the heart here. Here are some of the external anatomy structures of the heart. Again, I'm not gonna go through all of these. I do expect you to be able to know these based on, on a picture. Um, identification. You'll do, you've probably done these in lab already. A couple structures you may not be familiar with. One is the ligamentum arteriosum. This is, was what was called the ductus arteriosus uh, during fetal circulation since the baby is inside the womb. There's not a whole lot of point in the, all the blood going to the lungs since you're not going to get any oxygen there. He's not breathing inside that uterus. So we have a uh, ductus arteriosus, which is basically a bypass of the lungs. So blood goes out the pulmonary arteries, and instead of going off to the lungs, it goes through this little tunnel, or, or ductus arteriosus, where it can get to the aorta and then go to the rest of the body. Um, once you're born, of course, you don't need this bypass from the lungs, so it deteriorates and becomes the ligamentum arteriosum. Another structure you might not be familiar with is the anterior interventricular sulcus. This is basically the area that if I cut in there, I find the interventric interventricular septum, which is the wall that divides the two ventricles of the heart. And so a sulcus just means a groove, and you can see many of the blood vessels 
of the heart run in that sulcus. Here's the back side of the heart. Um, most of these structures, again, you'll, you've covered in lab. Notice there is a posterior interventricular sulcus, so that's going to be another groove, another in area where a lot of the blood vessels run. And again, this is the location where you find the interventricular septum that divide the wall that divides those two ventricles. Internal anatomy of the heart, you can see here a little bit more time spent on these. This is concentrating just on the left side of the heart, so we have the left ventricle, the left atrium, and the valves associated with the left side. With the um, left side of the heart, is going to be the left AV valve or atrioventricular valve, also called the bicuspid or mitral valve. We'll cover that more detail. They're also showing the pulmonary semilunar valve, which um, takes separates or, or stops blood flow going from the pulmonary trunk back into the ventricles. And again, we'll cover that in more detail later. And then you can see the major arteries like the pulmonary trunk and then artery here, pulmonary veins, and of course the aorta. Here's more of the internal anatomy. Now we're looking, concentrating on the right side. So you have the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the right atrioventricular valve between them. Blood comes back to the heart, either the superior vena cava from the head and arms, or the inferior vena cava from the trunk and legs back into the right atrium. And then we also see the valves, but they're not labeled in this diagram. The coronary arteries are arteries that are important for um, circulation of the heart or providing the heart with oxygen. The muscle of the heart is too thick for simple diffusion of oxygen from the ventricles or atriums of the heart into the muscle fiber. So we need our own little circulatory system for the heart and that's of course the coronary arteries. The left and right coronary arteries um, arise from the aorta and you can see that here they're just pictured here's the left and here's a little bit of the right they're kind of underneath this pulmonary artery but they right at the base of the aorta those openings for those arteries exist the left coronary artery branches into the left anterior descending artery here or what's called the circumflex artery, which kind of heads more towards the back or, or the um, side of the heart. Now the left anterior descending artery is also referred to as the widow maker because um, of a heart attack or a, if occlusion or blockage occurs in that artery, um, it can result in a heart attack. Um, heart attacks born in this artery have a kill rate of about 90%. Once the artery is fully occluded, the owner has only about five minutes before a massive heart attack and uh, what amounts to almost certain death. The um, About 40 to 50% of heart attacks occur in that artery. Um, the circumflex artery that I mentioned, that's about 15 to 20% of heart attacks occur there. And then the right coronary artery um, that I mentioned is going to feed more of the right side of the heart. Um, heart attacks there occur in about 30 to 40 percent. Now blood flow through the heart, um, needs, you need to have this down absolutely cold. Uh, there's no doubt about it that you've got to get every little bit of it down. I do have a link to a video down here that could, you can watch on YouTube that may help. And also notice that the numbers on here correspond to blood flow through the heart. And I've left the labels for those um, numbers on the note section on the PowerPoint slides. So if you look at that, you'll have the list. You don't have to worry as I run through this. Um, to madly copy them down right now. Just listen. So blood comes back to the heart into the right atrium. From the right atrium it has to pass through the right AV valve and enters the right ventricle. From there the blood leaves the right ventricle, goes through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary trunk and then out to the left side or the left lung through the left pulmonary artery and then kind of behind here through the right um, pulmonary artery to the right lung. It goes off to the lungs, gets oxygenated, 
comes back to the lungs via the pulmonary veins. Now it's either the right pulmonary veins here coming back from the right lung or the left pulmonary veins from the left lung. Either one, they come back and dump blood into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it passes through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, it then is pumped out underneath this, underneath the pulmonary trunk, into the aorta and through a valve called the aortic semilunar valve and then out to the aorta. The blood goes out to the body, to various areas. It could be up to the head, up to the arms, down the trunk, down to the legs, and out to the systemic circulation. As it comes back towards the heart, it either comes in through the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava to enter the right atrium again, and we start all over. Now the heart valves are designed to control blood flow and prevent backlog of blood or flow of blood in the wrong direction. We have two sets of valves. There's the semilunar valves, which have cusps. Think of cusps as little cups that are positioned to prevent blood going the wrong direction. So there's two pulmonary, two semilunar valves, the pulmonary semilunar valve or the aortic semilunar valve. The atrioventricular valves are the ones between the atriums and the ventricles. So we have a right and a left. The right valve is also called the tricuspid. The left is called either the bicuspid or mitral valve. The structure of these is based is again cusps. A bicuspid valve would have two. A tricuspid valve would have three. They also have a little bit more structure to them in that they have chordae tendinae and papillary muscles. Now we look at these here in the picture. You can see them. Here is the pulmonary semilunar valve. Here's just a piece of the aortic semilunar valve. Here's the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. Here's the cusps, all you can see here. Here are the chordae tendinae, the little strings that hold the muscle to the muscle called the papillary muscle. Now the valves you can also see are in one layer pretty much. If I cut the heart this way transversely, I can see all the, all the valves at once. So you can see the big um, AV valves with the chordae tendinae attached to them. Notice that the cusps in this case are pointing down so that the, the it's like the bowl is upside down. Where here the cusps are pointing up, so the bowl is, is up. Okay, so it's basically the direction that we're stopping the blood flowing from. We want that cusp facing that direction. The way these valves work, we can see here for the semilunar valves, you can imagine blood or the ventricles contracting, pushing blood either out into the pulmonary trunk or the aorta. And then when the when the valves empty, or excuse me, when the ventricles empty, they need to stop blood from coming back from those arteries back into the ventricles. So that when blood rushes and pushes against the cusps, the cusps close and therefore prevent that blood flow from getting down into the ventricles, stopping them from a backflow again into the ventricles. The AV valves work similarly. In this case, we've got blood moving from the atriums into the ventricles, and so they're open here, but now when the ventricles contract, we don't want the blood to go back up into the atriums. We want it to go out to the arteries. So to prevent them from going backwards, we have the AV valves and so the cusps are pointing down so that when the blood hits them the cusps collapse on one another closing the valve. Now the chordae tendinae and papillary muscles add just a little extra structure to it. Think of it like a um, the supporting structure of an umbrella um, so that the umbrella doesn't invert on itself or the cusps don't go this into the atrium and therefore blood would enter into the atrium. We don't want that. So we need a little extra structure to keep those cuffs pointing in the right direction because this is a lot of pressure when the ventricles contract. When the blood is moving in the arteries back toward the cusps in the semilunar valves, there's just not as much pressure. You don't need those fancy structures, the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles to keep these cusps from collapsing. Okay. 
Now, often we get some valve problems. A normal valve, remember, when it should open properly so blood flows in just nice and fine through from the atriums to the ventricles. And then when the ventricles contract, we want to make sure those valves close just tight, nice and tightly so the blood doesn't go back up into the atriums. So this would be a normal heart. A stenosis is with a problem with closing. The valves may have um, become hardened or stiff with calcium deposits or scarring, so it's hard to push them open. So the blood has to flow through a smaller opening so less blood gets into the, or through the valve into the next chamber. Um, if in this picture they're showing it from the atrium to a ventricle, and you can see that these guys just didn't open as well, so you get kind of a, a crappy blood flow into that ventricle. A regurge or regurgitation, it results when the valves don't close tightly. So the valve supporting structures may be loose or torn, or the valve itself um, may have stretched or thinned. Then the blood can't leaks it back into uh, the atrium or the or other to wrong direction uh, through the valve. So you can see here in this picture the valves didn't close properly, and so blood is leaking back up into the atriums. Either stenosis or regurgitation, you get what's called turbulent flow. That is not a nice smooth flow, but a wavy, noisy flow and that actually can be heard in a stethoscope and that's how a doctor can pick it up. Now causes of these can be many. Uh, I have a mitral valve regurge um, and the first thing the doctor asked me is if I had rheumatic fever um, which is a childhood um, reaction or childhood disease due to reaction to streptococcal bacteria. I didn't know that I did but so it could have been a genetic part of this that um, I just you know have a bad valve to begin with. Um, we just simply don't know. Um, stenosis can happen as again meant, as I mentioned that calcium deposits or scarring if you had um, bacterial infections on the valve for some reason bacteria just love valves to live on those and it can stiffen them up and then therefore it doesn't open properly. Now the layers of the heart um, will start with the pericardium. The pericardium is that serous membranes that cover the heart we can actually think of these um, pericardium as two layers. We've got a fibrous pericardium. That's this outside thick fibrous layer of dense connective tissue. It functions to protect the heart. It's a little stiffer than just the serous pericardium would be. It also anchors the heart, you can see here, to the diaphragm. And because it's a little stiffer and thicker, it can also prevent the heart from overfilling and therefore get overextended. The serous pericardium is the serous membranes that produce serous fluid. We've got the parietal pericardium, which is just on the inside um, of the fibrous pericardium. And then we've got also the visceral pericardium, which is the outer covering of the heart. In between them would be then the pericardial cavity. And the whole idea, again, of serous membranes here is to produce the serous fluid to fill the cavity and reduce the friction when the heart is contracting. Now one of the conditions associated with the pericardium is called pericarditis. It's inflammation of the serous membranes. Um, this inflammation can cause um, roughness to occur on the surface of the serous membranes. And so when a beating heart rubs against it, it'll cause a creaking sound that can be heard on a stethoscope. The symptoms typically seen are deep uh, pain in the sternum. And it may also, this inflammation may lead to adhesions. These are like little connections um, that between the visceral and parietal, it's like think of the visceral and parietal as basically sticking together, and that's going to impede heart activity. Now, severe pericarditis, you can get excessive fluid that compresses the heart and limits the ability of the heart to pump blood. Causes are several idiopathic means, basically, I don't know, it just happened. Uh, could be trauma to the chest that can lead to inflammation in the pericardium, a heart attack, surgeries, open heart surgeries, or infections can all cause pericarditis. Um, if the pericarditis gets severe enough, it can lead to what's called a cardiac tamponade. This is a buildup of a fluid in the pericardial cavity that ends up compressing the heart and decreases the functioning of the heart. 
and to fix that you have to insert a syringe and drain off the fluid if you watch Grey's Anatomy the ending of I don't know what season it was but when they had the plane crash Mark had a cardiac tamponade and they had to insert a tube into his chest to drain off the fluid in that pericardial sac. The layers of the heart um, are three. We have, if we start on the inside, the endocardium. This is continuous with the endothelial tissue that lines the blood vessels. It also covers the valves and so that we have nice one nice smooth layer through the entire cardiovascular system. The thickest part of the heart is the um, myocardium. This is the cardiac muscle and um, fiber skeleton that's contained within the myocardium. And then the outer layer of the heart is called the epicardium. This is the same layer as the visceral pericardium. And then this picture also shows the parietal pericardium and the fibrous pericardium as well. Then the fibroskeleton that I mentioned is basically connective tissue that you can see between the valves that surround each of the valves and connect between the valves. This connective tissue has several functionings. Um, one, it gives support to the valves, so the valves have a better structure for them so they don't end up becoming overstretched uh, with time. It also gives support for the cardiac muscle to actually contract against so it has some structure to be able to contract with. And then another function is it's going to prevent, con prevent conduction of electric currents from moving from the atriums, which would be above in this picture, kind of coming out of the screen. So the electrical impulses from those atriums can't travel down into the ventricles. That was we can limit the amount of electrical current between the atriums and ventricles because of this fibroskeleton. So that ends all of our anatomy associated with the heart and next we'll be moving into looking at how cardiac muscle actually contracts.